Hey, will somebody please pass the ketchup? <laughs> this is a tasty burger. I'll take a Gordon's burger and a side of Jason's finger. That would skip on the meat. Uh, I got a real good eye for prime meat. <laughs> Happy Halloween and welcome to Hamburgers and Horror, the home of meat, monsters, and machete-wielding maniacs. I'm Noah Hook and today I'll be ranking all 12 of the Friday the 13th films. Over the past four decades, Jason Voorhees has been terrifying audiences with his evolving looks, enigmatic personality, and brutal variety of kills. We've watched his mother avenge his childhood drowning, and we've watched him grow from a zippy little slasher into an absolute unit of mass murder. We've watched him die, be imitated, and even brought back to life, at which point he only increased his bloodshed. He's visited New York, gone to hell, been sent to the future, gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with Freddy, and even been completely rebooted. Even the worst Friday films are a ton of fun to watch, and at their best, they offer up some of the very best of what the slasher genre has to offer. Today I'm going to take the very big and cliche and controversial task of trying to rank all of these films from worst to best. There's obviously a ton that goes into my criteria for breaking down these films and ranking them, but it basically looks like this. Ambition, the story, plot, and originality. Quality, the acting, cinematography, sets. Quality of Jason and Crystal Lake's lore and continuity. How scary and entertaining it is. Quality of the effects and kills. And finally, cool factor. This is basically just how much I like the movie. Everybody has their favorites. Before jumping in, I just want to say this was a really challenging list to make. I'd say there's a lot of films that are generally considered the better ones and ones that are considered the worst ones, but everybody has a little bit of variation in their lists that I've seen, and I looked at like 50 of them just for this video for reference. My list is by no means the right list, I'm just sharing some of the reasons I prefer some of the films over others. The Friday franchise has something for everyone to love and something for everyone to hate, so please let me know what your rankings of the films are down in the comments. But with all of that said, it's probably time we get started. Number 12. Dead Last is sadly, but somewhat obviously going to Part 8, Jason Takes Manhattan. We've all heard the jokes before, I've honestly heard this film be referred to as Jason Takes a Boat as much as it has its actual title. And it's a shame really, because this film really had the potential to be super cool. Even 10 or 15 more minutes in New York City in some cool, recognizable locations would have been enough to skyrocket this film higher into the list. The cruise ship setting makes for a generic alien knockoff kind of feeling without any of the claustrophobia or interesting set design. And once we finally get to New York, there are about 30 seconds of recognizable imagery before the film reverts us back to alleyways and sewers but the lackluster settings are far from the film's only problem. Rennie is genuinely my least favorite final girl in the entire franchise. Oh no, her uncle tossed her in a lake once as a kid, and that gives her some kind of psychic connection with little boy Jason? Um, sure. Not to mention little boy Jason looks fucking absurd here. Rennie puts up basically zero fight against Jason, her uncle, or the random ass New York rapists that captured her. And that ending in the sewers is so illogical, but also incredibly vague in regards to whether Jason died or not. On the bright side though, Manhattan still has that classic kind of feeling that you can really only get from the first eight films before the franchise really starts throwing shit at the wall to see what sticks. It features some solid kills like rocker girl JJ's guitar head smash, camera enthusiast Wayne's meltdown, sauna guy's rocky demise, and of course Julius's rooftop beheading. Kane Hodder's performance is more reserved than his other iterations, but Jason at least gets a lot of screen time this far into the franchise. It isn't leaps and bounds worse than the next couple films we'll be talking about in the list, but for me, the lack of Crystal Lake and interesting characters, along with the avalanche of bizarre script decisions, leave this one being the Friday film I revisit the least. Number 11. Sorry nitpicks, I just couldn't take it any higher. 
Up next is the first of the aforementioned sequels that came after Part 8 that really started throwing out some crazy ideas, this one being Jason Goes to Hell the Final Friday. This, along with maybe the reboot and Part 5, is one of the most divisive films in the franchise. People either love it or hate it most of the time, and more people fall into the latter when it comes to this film. The Final Friday takes what was a somewhat supernatural but primarily slasher-centric franchise and turns it on its head. It sought to answer questions like how did Jason come back and how does he keep surviving such brutal injuries? Those answers were found by turning him into an evil hellspawn monster that is capable of taking over other bodies. On top of that, we're suddenly introduced to Jason's family, who have apparently just lived in Crystal Lake all these years while Voorhees has been slaughtering people. We've also got Creighton Duke's crazy ass, a fucking magical sword, the Necronomicon, and giant demonic hands pulling Jason to hell. I can understand if you appreciate this one for its ambition and uniqueness in the franchise, but for me it just tries to do too much for the ninth film in a franchise. There are new revelations every 10 minutes or so, all the way up until the last 10 minutes, which sounds really exciting but is honestly just mostly confusing. I do think it's a very cool concept for a horror movie, it just doesn't make sense in this franchise. I do have a fair amount of positives for this film as well though. Jason looks great the little he is on screen, and the practical effects for the variety of kills and monsters look really good. You've got this guy melting down into a hellraiserous pile of goo, Voorhees getting blown to smithereens, Coroner Phil munching on Jason's heart, Joey getting her face punched in, Vicky going out like a badass, and of course Deborah getting ripped in half by a wrought iron pole. I can watch The Final Friday and have a good time with it, but whenever I approach it I really think of it as a reboot the same way I do it as the 2009 version. I can't take all of this new information and the incongruencies and try to apply those to the 8 previous films, it just doesn't work, it's too big of an ask for the audience. Perhaps if it got a sequel or was even a trilogy I'd feel really different as those ideas could be expanded on further but everyone pretty unanimously agreed to forget about this one. It is one of the most interesting films in the series, but for me the lack of physical Jason, the severe shift in subgenre, the surprisingly uninteresting main characters, and the rapid fire exposition heavy plot leave me with more critiques than praises that I can give the film. Number 10. Speaking of what if crazy sequels that tried too hard to be different, up next is Jason X. I went back and forth between X and Goes to Hell quite a few times on this list, but I ultimately gave the edge to this one because I think it's a slightly more cohesive and approachable film to watch on its own. That being said, I have just as many gripes with it. My biggest issue is it just leans too far into comedy and absurdity for me. The franchise has always had a bit of a comedic tinge to it, but the horror has always been the center. Here it's just a bunch of cringy, sarcastic dialogue, weird scenarios to put Jason in, and kills that would rather function as a joke than a truly suspenseful moment. Final Girl Rowan is really boring and does little throughout the film, and the spaceship set looks like a crappy spaceship set. So many vague, dark corridors. The plot ultimately doesn't do very many cool things with the space setting until the finale, but them being in space creates a lot of weird goals and challenges that they have to solve so they can try to escape the ship that just make for really boring and repetitive movements throughout the ship. Oh no, Jason broke this so we have to go and fix this is a problem that happens like three times in a row in the film just to buy time so the plot can chug along. On the bright side though, X does show off some really cool effects. KM's killing of Jason is great, his return as Uber Jason looks fantastic in my opinion, we get a David Cronenberg cameo, the VR sleeping bag scene, and of course Adrian's face freezing kill. Similar to The Final Friday, this totally feels like a what if kind of scenario more than a proper sequel, but I think this film embraces that and has a lot of fun with it, instead of trying to make it all make too much sense together. 
It was a rushed project made to keep interest in Freddy vs. Jason alive, and at times you can really feel that haste in the final project. All in all, Jason X isn't one of my favorites, but I've thrown it on many times when I just want a zany slasher on in the background. If nothing else, the film is a lot of fun. Number 9 Up next is a film I really wanted to put higher, but I just couldn't bring myself to let Part 7 go any further. For me, The New Blood marks a noticeable jump in quality from the films we've already talked about, but I still have a lot of issues with it. On paper, the idea of Jason taking on somebody arguably more powerful than him is exciting, and pinning that down to a telekinetic, emotionally volatile teenager is even more so. But then the movie just doesn't give me any kind of a convincing reason or explanation for why Tina is telekinetic. She just fucking is, don't bother asking why. Laura Park Lincoln does a great job portraying Tina's emotional states, and she proves to be a badass by the finale. I really genuinely love this finale, it's one of the best in the whole franchise, but unfortunately there is just a lot of uninteresting stuff happening before we get there. Dr. Cruz could have been a really compelling secondary villain, but dude dies before we can really understand what he wanted to accomplish with his destructive little patient. The side crew of teenage meatbags are pretty forgettable this time around, aside from mean girl Melissa, I love her. But golly, this movie has by far the best look for at least undead Jason that we've ever gotten. John Carl Beekler took note of every injury Voorhees had taken in the past and integrated it into his design, and it just adds so much to the character. This version of Jason is pissed off. Oh, that face reveal also rivals part 4 for the best of all time as well. Sadly the kills were really butchered by the MPAA, but there are still some strong ones. We've got Melissa's axe and yeet, the party horn in the eye, and Judith's iconic tree slam. But for me the single most annoying aspect comes at the very end when Tina's goober ass father is somehow resurrected, but also somehow not a pile of bones. And somehow he's powerful enough to pull Jason down to the bottom of the lake again. I know I'm nitpicking, but it's just so silly, why the fuck wasn't his body ever removed from the lake? We get this really cool fight between Tina and Jason, and I don't want to downplay how many great moments happen during that, but it ends just a bit anticlimactically due to that. We end exactly where we started, with Jason in the bottom of the lake. All in all, Part 7 has some really high highs, but the pacing, forgettable characters, and arbitrary inclusion of telekinesis leave me wanting a bit more by the time the credits roll. Number 8 The next film is also the newest, as my number 8 spot is going to go to the 2009 reboot of Friday the 13th. This project attempted to merge the biography of Jason we came to learn in the first four films, while simultaneously upgrading the sluggish slasher into a brutal, fast-paced killing machine. We get Pam's beheading, the severed head shrine, and a rediscovery of the hockey mask amongst other iconic moments. It's visually the most polished film in the entire franchise, and it's technically very well made, so what's the issue? There are some specifics I'll get into in a sec, but generally this film just lacks the earnest charm that the other films have. The best way I can describe it is to think of the first four Friday films as these classic albums by an artist you love, and the reboot is a single greatest hits album by a cover band. For me, the Friday films shine in their low budgets, nobody special actors, modest but inventive effects, and weird ass characters. To compare to Part 7, that feels like a passion project, while this lacks the personality and feels more like a cash grab than anything else. But with all of that said, this is the first Friday film we've gotten in a long time that doesn't rely on some kind of ridiculous gimmick. You're watching this to see Jason kill people, and you definitely get a lot of that. The kills are the standout aspect of this film, with a few highlights including Trent's impaling on a pickup truck, Jenna's surprise stabbing, Chelsea's below deck stabbing, and Amanda's rotisserie style death. And while the recycling of familiar scenes sometimes feels a bit heavy handed, it does end up making a tight and neat package to learn about Jason in. 
And I imagine that it functioned as a great intro to Jason for a bunch of people born in the late 90s and early 2000s. And realistically, from an objective standpoint, it's probably up there as one of the scariest Friday films as well. There are some truly suspenseful moments in there. All in all, the reboot is a fine retelling and condensing of Jason's history. If you prefer newer, more polished, faster paced slashers, this will probably be higher in your rankings. I enjoy it for what it is, but for me it just doesn't do quite enough to distinguish itself from its predecessors. Number 7 Up next is another film that draws really strong emotions from fans, as we're talking about part 5. Yes, yes, I know, let's get it out of the way now, it doesn't have real Jason, how dare they trick us. Honestly, the lack of Jason isn't what bothers me about this film. I think the idea of him living on through legend and copycat killers is actually an interesting idea to take the franchise. My issue lies in the execution of that idea, as Roy just doesn't make for a very compelling character. Sure, his son was murdered, but we didn't know until the very ending of the film by the time Roy was dead that they were even related. Aside from that, he gets like two lines the entire movie, so if anything, you expect him to be a nothing character that is killed at some point. It's basically like, what if we made the biggest, most obvious red herring the killer? He wasn't as out of left field as Pamela's reveal, but he also doesn't bring the same energy that she does to the original. It's a surprise, I suppose, but it isn't really exciting. But the Roy thing really isn't what lands a new beginning this low, that lands more on my uninterest in what they decided to do with Tommy in this film. His obsession and hallucinations about Jason make sense to a degree, but seeing him as this brooding, super aggro teen is simply my least favorite of the three Tommies we get in the series. The other Halfway House kids are also pretty dull, but where Part 5 truly shines is its wild-ass Crystal Lake locals. My favorite parts of this film are when we're introduced to some whack jobs like Ethel just for them to be killed. This movie gives us Ethel and Junior, Dirty Guy Neil, Vinny and Pete, Billy and Lana, and Demon and Anita. So many great, hilarious, bizarre characters that I love to death, and all great characters I loved watching die. But we also get more wholesome characters like Gramps and Reggie. The movie does feel like a seedy porno shoot at times, as the nudity reaches a higher than usual level of gratuity. But this film took on the daunting task of trying to make a Friday film without Jason, and honestly it's surprising that it came out this good. I actually enjoy Part 5 and really love its wacky cast of characters, but for me it just doesn't quite stack up to the films I consider to be in the top half of the list. Number 6 Narrowly making its way to the top half of the list is Freddy vs. Jason. This 2003 crossover finally gave slasher fans the film of their dreams after it was teased a decade earlier in the final Friday. This movie has a lot of great stuff going for it. It obviously has the wonderful inclusion of Freddy Krueger, for which Robert Englund turns in a top tier performance. Seeing Jason go toe to toe and machete to razor glove with him is so much fun, with both slashers getting a lot of good licks in. And it manages to pull from both franchises to combine their themes and visual styles really cohesively. It also has a lot of memorable kills, including Trey's stab and fold, Gib and her rapist's impaling, Mark's melty back, and Freeberg's bifurcation. And of course, all the ridiculous damage Freddy and Jason do to each other. But it isn't quite a perfect film, as whenever the icons are off screen, I am having a way less interesting time. The protagonists are some of the least interesting we've gotten in the Friday or the Nightmare franchise, and they all serve as these really awful 2000s teenage stereotypes. Kia, Freeberg, Trey, Linderman, and a few other so-called protagonists are just too unlikable for my liking. And that includes some really cringy and offensive dialogue as well. The Freddy and Jason fight also relies too much on absurd super strength to send them flying into new set pieces, which makes for really uninteresting cinematography. Fly stunt doubles, fly! But generally my complaints about Freddy vs. Jason are pretty small and inconsequential to my overall enjoyment of the film. 
It's probably less interesting to folks who haven't seen both franchises before, but for longtime slasher fans, it's very rewarding. It's one of the very few horror crossovers we've ever gotten, and it's surprising how good it turned out given the years of development hell that it sat through. Plus, this film gives us the ungodly abomination that is the hookah smoking Freddy worm. What else could you ask for? Number 5. Up next is probably the last film that is really debatable on whether it is good or not, as I've seen it all over the place on other lists. But I've come to admire it a lot, and my number 5 spot goes to Part 3, or should I say 3D. This one gets a bit of a bad rap for its three-dimensional shenanigans, as the damn entire film feels like a technical reel of shit lunging at the screen. Obviously, we aren't watching this film today in 3D 99% of the time, so this just leaves the story being interrupted for silly gags that we can't even appreciate. This is also the first Friday film to have characters that really slip into cliches, with prankster Shelly and stoners Chuck and Chili mostly being included for laughs. But as I've made pretty clear already, this is not a franchise very well known for its character development. What Part 3 lacks in intellect, it makes up for with a lot of fun and a lot of iconic moments for Jason. This is the birth of the Hockey Mask, which of course became a franchise mainstay forever, as well as one of the best Jason face reveals. Jason looks fantastic here, that image of him staring at Chris from the window is so bizarre and unsettling. Jason felt like a scrawny teenager in Part 2, but here he has grown into a hulking monster. It also has a bunch of fantastic kills like Andy's handstand bifurcation, Farrah's harpoon to the eye, Shelly's throat slit, and of course Rick's ridiculous head squeeze. And who could forget the phenomenal acting from Chili? Chris is also one of the best final girls in the franchise as she puts up a hell of a fight in the finale. This is the one and only film that insinuates that Jason is maybe a rapist though, which is very uncomfortable and I don't even know what to do with. All in all, I do consider Part 3 a bit of a mixed bag, but it just has enough fun and energy to keep it really enjoyable on a rewatch. This movie cemented what the character of Jason truly is, and started his turn from a town that dreaded sundown knockoff into a full-blown horror icon. Number 4. Up next is another tricky film for me to rank. I've seen it really low on some lists, but I've also seen it in the number 1 spot quite a few times. I'm talking about the 1980 original, which of course does not involve Jason until the final three seconds. This one just functions so differently because it's the only film where we truly don't know who the killer is. Part 2 is kind of a mystery at first, and Part 5 is a bait and switch, but the original is the only true whodunit in the series. Is the culprit someone we've never met? Yeah, it is. Did we even hear her name before she was revealed? Well, no, we didn't. It's perhaps the most out of left field killer reveal I've ever seen, which unfortunately makes it more confusing than riveting. It becomes clear who Pam is and why she's doing what she's doing though, and Betsy Palmer's wild performance is dynamic enough to distract from the somewhat confusing introduction. But even before that, she proves to be a ruthless and inventive killer. You've got Annie's throat slit, Jack's arrow through the throat, and Marcy's axe to the face. But Mama Voorhees didn't make it out of the film alive either, as Final Girl Alice full-on decapitates her. Tom Savini's inventive DIY effects look great here, and they look especially believable in this gritty, low-budget feature. I also love the use of POV in the film, we take on the position of Pam as we stalk the kids from the woods in a really unsettling way. It is probably the single slowest film in the franchise though, with a lot of nothing scenes of characters literally doing nothing for really extended amounts of time, clearly just to pad the runtime. And while most of the kills are good to great, there are a bit too many off-screen kills or just below screen stabs for my liking as well. This was a humble start for what would become one of the greatest horror franchises of all time, but even for a slow start, this film has so much going for it. Tom Savini's effects, Harry Manfredini's score, the mimicry of Halloween cinematography, and the extra infusion of sexuality and gore came to define an entire decade of films. 
It helped to ignite the slasher boom, and very few films in or out of this franchise have made as big of a wave as this absolute classic did. Number 3. Coming in just ahead of the original as its direct sequel, as I consider part 2 to be a fantastic continuation of the story. This one, along with the next two films that I'll be talking about, simply have a bit of everything that you want in a Friday film. This is the proper introduction of Jason Voorhees, and similarly to part 1, this was so early that he wasn't an icon yet. This little bag-headed fellow wasn't a totally mindless killing machine yet, he was killing with motive. The whole opening sequence where he gets revenge on Alice with an ice pick is great, and the only time in Jason's pre-death life that we see him may be outside of Crystal Lake. I guess Alice could be a local, but I've always taken it that the camp counselors seem to come from the next town or county over. Anyways, it's a great segue into a new group of counselors arriving years later, at which point the hillbilly boy takes up his mama's murderous mantle. Jason stays off screen until about two thirds of the way through, but his proper unveiling when he kills Vicky is really slow and unsettling. He racks up a great batch of kills in this film, including Crazy Ralph's strangulation, Deputy Winslow's hammer to the dome, Mark's machete and roll, and Jeff and Sandra's two-for-one spear kill. Oh, and not to mention that beautiful severed head. And generally, everything feels a bit more polished this time around. The cinematography utilizes more moving shots and effectively uses the darkness to hide Jason at times. Manfredini's score only gets better the second time around, and the fact it's a sequel means the movie can jump into slicing and dicing a bit more quickly. And perhaps most importantly, Part 2 has Ginny, who I'd argue is the single best final girl in the franchise, but quite possibly in my top 10 favorites of all time. She puts up a great fight against Jason, but she ultimately uses her brain and a bit of that child psychology that she's been studying to outwit the murderous mama's boy. And aside from maybe the reboot, I'd say Part 2 is genuinely the scariest Friday film as well. I really have no complaints about this one. The only thing I can think to say is the movie is still trying to find its identity and carve out a niche for itself, so it still feels kind of like a redo of Part 1 until the finale. But if it ain't broke, don't fix it, just expand on it, and that's what Part 2 does very well. Number 2. Deciding which of the remaining films would get the penultimate spot was really challenging. This and my number one are basically neck and neck, but I ultimately gave the silver to part four, the final chapter. Similarly to part two, I have no real complaints about this one. It takes the best elements from the previous three films and synthesizes it into a fantastic finale. By now, the character of Jason has been perfected. He's got the look, he's got the swagger, and he's got the killing down by now. This film gives us Axel's bone saw neck snap, Samantha's skinny dipping stab, Jimmy's corkscrew and cleaver stab, Ted's flapper era porn projection kill, Rob's he's killing me, he's killing me death, amongst many other series standouts. And of course, my favorite kill of all time, the brutal elimination of Jason himself. The character arc of Tommy Jarvis from a dorky kid to a little prototype Jason is great, and he and Trish have one of the best final girl and boy circuits in the franchise. And this is right up there as the best looking Jason we've ever gotten. The effects that went into his death are so extensive and cool looking, I'm still in awe of them today. I really like the deviation away from the usual gaggle of horny teens to focus on a family as well. My only small issue with the film does have to do with this group of teens though, I just think they are largely forgettable, and the middle portion of the film where we focus on them just drags a bit. Like we spend so much time watching Ted watch flapper porn, let's speed things up a bit shall we? But this film makes it clear these are not the characters we're supposed to care about, as they are all expendable at the hands of Jason. Oh fuck, I almost forgot to mention Banana Girl! How could I forget? But this film really gives us all the best stuff to enjoy about living Jason, while still keeping the plot really simple and straightforward. It provides us with Crispin Glover's dance moves, Lil Baby Corey Feldman going apeshit, another absurd fake head crush, 
good boy Gordon, who does survive the film, and the very best death of Jason Voorhees. I'd very easily understand it being your number one, but for me there is just one other Friday that tops it a little bit. Number one. If you've been paying attention, you should know what's left. My top spot goes to part six, Jason Lives. While part four gives us the very best of living Jason, I think part six is the very best of undead Jason. His rotting zombie design looks sick, and while I can admit his outfit is a little goofy in this one, it mostly works for me. This film is where Jason becomes truly unstoppable, and it's also the beginning of him getting way more screen time. This is Jason's world, and we're just dying in it. But along with the increase in Jason comes an increase in style as well. This film brings in elements of gothic horror as well as an extra dose of comedy, and along with some upgrades in cinematography and action, this genuinely feels more polished than most of the other sequels in this list. Undead Jason is no slouch at killing either, with a few highlights including Alan's heart removal, the triple decapitation, Nikki and Court's RV disaster, and Sheriff Garrus getting folded in half. But what truly makes Part 6 stand out to me is the fantastic character work done in it. This is the one and only Friday film where I truly begin to care for and mourn characters who die. Sure, Court, Nikki, Sissy, and Paula are sassy, quirky counselors, but here they are all really likable and sweet. There is definitely humor thrown into the mix, but all of their deaths have a tinge of sorrow to them. They were good kids and genuinely did not deserve this fate, and I commend this stupid slasher for making me care about them. That aspect is helped by this being the only film in the entire series to actually have campers around, which gives the counselors a purpose as they try to protect the kids. This is also a great continuation for Tommy Jarvis as he finally manages to face down his childhood fears. Even though Jason was fucking dead and you brought him back to life and then settled with just leaving him in a lake, Tommy. I can understand if Jason Lives leans too far into comedy or if you simply prefer human Jason, but for me, Six strikes the perfect chord between scary, funny, wholesome, and horny. It manages to save the franchise from falling into obscurity, well at least for a little while, by finding an exciting new angle for Jason. It gives us the best camp setting, some of the best technical quality, a lot of the best characters, and some of the most iconic moments our good friend Jason has ever had. And there you have it! Those are my rankings for the Friday franchise! What do you think of my list? Agree? Disagree? Let me know down in the comments, I would love to see how you rank these movies and what your favorites are. I was pretty brief with my reasons and explanations, so if you want a more thorough look at my ideas, go and watch my full reviews of all of these films. Also go check out my ranking video for the top 20 kills in the franchise if you haven't done so already. Well, that's about it folks! After 10 long months, we are finally done with the Friday the 13th franchise! It has been so much fun covering these classics on the channel, and I love that I was able to wrap it up on Halloween. I'll be taking a break from franchises for the rest of the year to cover some one-offs and some patron requests, so be sure to tune in soon for some exciting, interesting movies. The first of which is going to be Peter Jackson's Brain Dead, aka Dead Alive. We'll see if I can get that one monetized. Thank you all so much for joining me, and an extra thank you to my patrons. As always, I'm Noah Hook, and thanks for watching Hamburgers and Horror. Stay safe out there. Thanks for watching my rankings of the Friday the 13th films. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like and subscribe so you can keep up with all my horror reviews. And if you want to help support the channel further, you should check out my Patreon account. You'll be able to vote for future movies and franchises I cover on the channel. Thanks y'all.